Alright, cool. So, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lucas Perry. I'm from the Future of Life Institute, and I work on AI risk and nuclear weapons risk related projects at FOI. And I'm uh, Richard Mala. I work on uh, AI uh, risks as well uh, for the AI projects. So, just something before we begin, I guess it's kind of interesting uh, for us to gauge because it's going to help us in our presentation. Uh, raise your hand here if you think about or know what existential risks are. Okay, cool. That's helpful. <laughs> uh, so, just going forward, uh, so this workshop here is just really for trying to develop some uh, skills for existential risk mitigation. Uh, we're going to get more into what that specifically looks like and how we're going to do that here today. Uh, it's going to be an activity-based thing. We're all going to be engaged with each other, so hopefully it'll be a bit of fun. So, I mean, most of you guys know what this is, so I don't think I need to spend so much time on this, but for those of you that don't, existential risks are risks that are terminal uh, in severity and transgenerational in scope. So that means it's something like a human species extinction or the extinction of Earth-originating uh, intelligent life. Now, uh, generally, when we think about existential risks, they're divided into ones that are made by humans and ones that are not made by humans. Um, anthropogenic ones are ones that are human-made, and uh, non-anthropogenic ones are ones that are not made by people. Um, so, generally, in the existential risk community, we're more worried about anthropogenic risks, ones that are created by people. These are arising on much shorter timelines, uh, as you can see here, and refer to things like uh, unfriendly artificial intelligence, nuclear war, and global pandemics. Um, also, one reason why we care about them more is um, because we have more causal efficacy over them. That means that we can actually do something about them because the species were generating them. They're not something uh, very big and difficult to stop, like the end of the universe, like the cosmopolis, or like colliding with uh, Andromeda. Um, so, moving on from here, uh, effective altruism is, you know, uh, has these four main pillars. Uh, the deep future, animal suffering, meta-effective altruism, and, and global poverty. Uh, if we're trying to think about which of these issues we should be thinking about or which we should be working on, uh, there's generally uh, a way of thinking about this employed by 80,000 hours, just thinking about scale, neglectedness, and tractability. Uh, you can also consider your personal interests, your personal skills, and how good you are in that specific domain relative to everyone else who's working on it. So if we think about these four pillars of EA, we might think, okay, you know, working on existential risk mitigation seems like a pretty solid way to go. Um, and, and, and given that, uh, we're here to try and uh, help like, generate and create some, some life skills for existential risk mitigation. <coughs> so, so, so the idea is to um, have a uh, thinking cap on which is a little bit similar to that which um, X-risk orgs have on themselves. So trying to slip into their shoes and think of the types of considerations that um, existential risk mitigating organizations have. Um, <coughs> Some considerations, um, just a small handful of considerations these organizations have that individuals you don't usually have include actually, I'm an essay Do you want to write this? Yeah, so uh, yeah, the idea here is really just this, like, <coughs> like practice thinking about existential risk mitigation. Uh, and, and really what we're trying to do here is not so much for you to come up with a solution, like in the next hour, solve uh, the AI alignment problem, but it's really about you trying to focus on navigating the space, asking the right sorts of questions, and really identifying what the crucial considerations are. Existential risk mitigation is a very avant-garde and like new field where like the, <laughs> the territory is like very new, and uh, it's very difficult conceptually to navigate. And so it's, it's practicing really identifying questions, crucial considerations, and navigating a, a difficult conceptual space uh, with problems that are, are very large in scope, very high in impact, and, and difficult to understand. Um, and we're going to be sort of navigating through the space and identifying these questions um, uh, while also using different sorts of like tools and, and concepts and considerations which are helpful. So like we've identified some here, which we are going to provide you some with later that are helpful. Um, like one thing that the existential risk uh, mitigation orgs like to think about are information hazards. And so an information hazard is some bit of information that should it get out or should the, the wrong parties or agents learn about it, it would cause a lot of harm. Um, and when you're trying to work on something like AI risk or value alignment, uh, in artificial intelligence, um, there are certain considerations in safety, like when you're working on specific problems that you don't want other people to know about. So these are the sorts of concepts and considerations that um, uh, extra scores use, and we're going to try and use some of them here today. 
Um, so why should we be here? Why should we be practicing life skills for existential risk mitigation? Well, uh, existential risk mitigation is like a really young field. Uh, the orgs which exist might not be the best uh, for you. It might not be the best personal fit. It might not agree agree with like your, your skills or your goals or your values. Um, also, because of how new this field is, uh, it's, it's a super high impact field, but like where can you go to practice these things? Where can you go to learn about them? Really, there are some places on the internet, but like you can't go to like school for this. You like and like there's no like real formal places where you can train. Like okay, I'm going to go here and I'm going to think about existential risk mitigation. So it's important for us to come together and, and work on these things together. Um, also, like generally, I know for myself and perhaps some other individuals, like generally before you meet this community and you get involved with an existential risk mitigation org, uh, there's a certain level of difficulty aversion because existential risks are really large and they're difficult and they seem very intractable. So it's like, what the hell can I do about this? Like, just me being me. So it's about like getting together and getting through this, this difficulty aversion we feel towards existential risks. Um, and sure, shooting off this, it's also working on uh, trying to lessen like the doubt that you have about your ability to have an impact. And again, we were just sort of talking about how most of the existential risks we're worried about are anthropogenic in nature, they come from people, and because of that, we have a, a lot of causal efficacy over them. We can help impact them and, and, and mitigate risks. So it's about get, getting over your, your, your idea sort of that there, there's nothing that you can do about it. So here's what we're going to go ahead and do. Uh, you're going to found a new existential risk mitigation organization today. Um, and this... Uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be given a hypothetical like three million dollars, uh, and at the end of this period, uh, we want you to have like a very specific like action plan and procedure for uh, how you're going to go about um, like like I like working through questions and issues that you have in in, in navigating the space. So again, a really crucial consideration here is you identifying questions. It's about knowing what you know, knowing what you don't know, and identifying unknown unknowns. What is it that you don't know that you don't know about existential risk mitigation? Um, and how are you going to navigate this space? And how are you going to um, <coughs> sort of address these issues? It's, again, it's not about you having a specific action plan for like solving AI alignment uh, by 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock. Um, it's about, uh, you know, actionable steps that you could take at the end of this workshop that would be like good next steps, given what you know and what you don't know. So uh, we're going to start this uh, in a few minutes, but you're going to be breaking up into groups of five, and we're going to go through like three different sections of like working on existential risk mitigation. First, your group is going to work on a cause prioritization. So there are a lot of different existential risk causes. Uh, which ones do you guys want to work on? How do you want to work on these risks, given that there are other existential risk orgs emerging in the world, which might change which issues are more or less neglected? Um, how are you going to coordinate on that? Uh, the next section will be dedicated to resources. If you, have a, if you have a cause, then you need to have resources in order to um, apply to that cause to uh, mitigate that risk. So this part is really about sort of like real life um, thinking about what sorts of resources do you have in addition to this hypothetical three million which you might deploy for like certain reasons. Who do you know in your life? Who, who can you ask these questions? Who can you go to? What are the sorts of people that can help you with certain parts of this? What, which, which, which questions do you have that you don't know that you have uh, resources which can help you with them? Um, and then this final portion, which will be 20 minutes, will be after you've identified as a cause, and you sort of have an idea of what resources you have, is to come up with a specific action plan for how you're going to go about resolving your questions. How are you going to begin working on this risk? What are some actionable things that you can do at the end of the session, like literally you could go do to, to, to start working on these issues? Um, and then at the end, we're going to share like what people's ideas are about like what what you what you would do uh, if you were to pursue these things. Like, what are the specific action plans uh, that you would have? Um, so, just Richard here is going to touch base on uh, how to go about thinking about these different steps. So, <coughs> there are many different types of um, uh, cognitive tools and uh, concepts that are uh, relevant and useful for thinking about X risks and uh, for thinking about how to mitigate them. Um, <coughs> workshops by the Center for Applied, Applied Rationality um, have some great cognitive tools, things like uh, double-cruxing, uh, things like Fermi Estimates, many other tools. Um, Center for Effective Altruism has a great website on uh, concepts that are relevant for uh, X risks. Um, 
and I, I think it's simply concepts, uh, concepts that um, you talked about just in the work. Um, <clears throat> of course, Les Ron also has uh, many different discussions on, on cognitive tools and concepts. Today, <coughs> uh, we'll be focusing on a small number of tools. Um, given that there's such a large space, we can't cover them all. And we'd like to sort of focus here. So, so we'll be looking at asking the right questions, on uh, knowing what you don't know, on navigating these kinds of existential risk issues when you don't know what it is that you don't know about them, and about how to mitigate them. Actually trying, actually getting that, that um, you know, that push there to change the impetus from, uh, from uh, being complacent or being just not doing anything to actually moving in the right direction. Um, and then marshalling uh, one's resources. So this is a combination of the hypothetical resources we're giving you, um, as well as your res real resources, such as your connections. So when we consider unknown unknowns, um, <clears throat> one way that we'd like to, uh, to tackle this is to convert them as much as possible into known unknowns, to be able to uh, have something that can <clears throat> try to um, whether analyze or, or just uh, address. So, <coughs> um, coming from uh, data science, one does things like, am I too low for people? Okay. Um, coming from data science, uh, one can do things like uh, looking at uh, you know, clusters and try to do anomaly detection. But when it comes to our daily lives, um, we can translate some of these ideas into things like looking for <coughs> anomalies um, in our conceptual spaces. So looking for confusions that one has, um, controversies, looking for <coughs> um, anomalies in one's world model where if there are things that have been nagging you for a while, as to how they work or why they are the way they are. And you've just been putting them off. They may be a good place to look. Um, and again, confusion and controversies, both within oneself and uh, within one's group, are a good place to, to start looking at uh, for unknown unknowns. Um, one's own personal unknown unknowns um, differ from global ones. And given that we have what we might call a proto noosphere, the internet, um, one can start looking at the peripheries of what one does know um, and look at intersections between topics that you may be unsure whether they're connected or not. Um, doing things like reading uh, field surveys um, is good as well. Um, uh, things are, of course, also uh, you know, to be addressed in the future by the literature, but not necessarily addressed yet by the literature. So how does one approach um, thinking about these areas scientifically? Um, and what level of certainty or uh, statistical significance is required to actually be able to, to move forward in, in some of these areas. Um, some of these unknown unknowns, or a lot of these, are, are very difficult to quantify. Um, but it's good to start modeling the space uh, for yourself with respect to um, your expected likelihoods um, of there being significant unknown unknowns um, within the space that you care about. Um, and then you can modify these over time as you move on. Cool. So we have a big list here. It's a lot of <laughs> concepts, and uh, we're just going to leave them up here. Uh, so you can reference it if you'd like. But right now, what we want to go ahead and do is break up in your groups of five. Uh, find five people uh, who are right near you, and we're going to jump into this first section. You're going to have seven minutes starting now uh, to get with your group around you, and then to begin with cause prioritization. All right, you have seven minutes to come up with which causes you care about and your questions about them. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, you guys can each take maybe one to two minutes to sort of unpack like your, your, your cause area, why you sort of chose that cause area, what your resources look like, and what your, but mostly sort of unpack what your specific action plan is. Um, uh, as this is probably the most helpful and useful part of what that looks like. So uh, can we go ahead and start uh, with this group here? Is that, is that rough or something? Yeah, like a, like a minute, a minute, or a minute and a half. Oh, a minute and a half. Okay, yeah, cool. Okay, welcome. <laughs> Hello. We chose the topic of AI safety. We chose this topic because 
it has the potential to, you know, I mean, any existential risk has the potential to impact many future humans. We, our current expertise that we have on our team members is also amenable to, like, subject area knowledge in the field of AI safety. We are, so our plan, when we, like, looked at the analysis of the problem of AI safety, we thought that it was a talent-constrained problem area. We think that there are, there is, like, there are organizations that have funding, they want to fund the organization, but there's, like, a lack of people's, with, specifically with PhDs who are interested in doing work in the area to address this, we <clears throat> thought we would create a sort of fellowship program among uh, universities around the country. So the the notion is, if you get teams of faculty members across the country at universities like Stanford, MIT, Harvard, where you have technical talent, you fund research by principal investigators who are interested in doing AI safety work. They are specifically receiving funding to create, to collaborate with teams of undergraduate students on a particular AI safety research problem. Through the collaboration with faculty, the students would learn, <coughs> learn the AI safety skills needed. They'd be exposed potentially to AI safety, learn some skills to do research. They would have experience to like apply to graduate school and get a PhD to help like fill the talent pipeline down the long term. You also might have some immediate results of the research that you're funding. And basically to go into this, we have specific action plans about how we would like reach out to faculty members, establish ourselves as like reputable funders in the space by getting boards of advisors, of influential people like leveraging the connections that we have at EA and others. We <coughs> Yeah, and then we would like essentially figure out how do we like reach out and get people on board uh, with this sort of funding. So we have more details, but in short, that's how we do it. Thanks, Sweet. man. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, would you like to pass to this group? Yeah. Uh, awesome. So hi everybody. Uh, our group chose uh, like risk from like um, bio like biological risk. Um, something that we heard from another presentation earlier was like about antibiotic like superbugs and stuff like that about. Yeah, organisms such as that that know that have an immunity to the pre-existing like mechanisms we have to keep them in day. Um and they like some of these already do exist in like milder forms to what they could be. So that's one thing. Um, we chose this. Uh, we're not exactly like not, we're like we're a mathematician, a philosopher, and like uh, and a computer scientist. So we're not exactly skill set for biology. Well, we kind of biologist earlier, but two of our group left. Right? Yeah. So <laughs> so we're also going through a talent drain right now. But, <laughs> Yeah, so, I don't know, um, so that's like why it seemed like an interesting thing to us because based on the presentation it seemed like reasonably like more imminent and conceivable than like, um, I don't know, an asteroid hitting us or something like that. Um, resources that we wouldn't mind uh, calling upon are obviously like biologists and such, people in the research, who research this. Um, considering that there are a lot of like pre-existing like um, EA organizations, like the Good Food Institute, for example, that tangentially like are concerned with this like interest, but it's obviously not their direct one. Like that's like a potential like resource to like figure out like what is the direct route that is being least um, considered. Um, yeah, and like that's our action plan is admittedly like very preliminary and, and like investigative um, in light of our ignorance of the field, but. Um, yeah, like so come up with quarantine procedures and oh yeah, sorry. Okay, the one so we can implement them right away in the event that we do have a super bug. Uh yeah. Uh to to, to like to, to add to that, it's just like imagine like the possibility. Like right now, uh, it doesn't seem like they're like I don't know how true this is, but like, this is our intuition. Like there aren't robust like um uh, like protocols and mechanisms for like in the event like like you know. Has anyone seen Planet of the Apes or something? You know, like that's gonna happen or something like that. That's the kind of thing that like could potentially come in the form of like research on like ethics and protocols. So yeah. All right. Sweet. Thank you for sure. Thank you so much. No uh, so, got it. My computer is done. Uh, so yeah. Um, so we also chose artificial intelligence as our cause area to uh, primarily to be potential imminent you know, threat of that time scale wise. I do want to say that we did experience sixty percent member attrition part way through. So um, but our idea was to create a sort of at least an approximate scale which might be able to measure both the intelligence of an AI, which of course is a little bit nebulous, but also its capabilities, so also what it's networked to. 
um, something with maybe more general cognitive ability, which is pretty much kept offline, right? Um, doesn't have any actual means of networking itself, just physically cut off. It might be less dangerous than a slightly less able, you know, mentally able AI, which is networked to, say, a power grid where it can shut down a hospital, something along those lines. So we would want to assemble um, both AI researchers and, uh, like, you know, cyber security and cyber terrorism analysts to be able to look at both aspects of, um, you know, how dangerous the AI could be. And so our action plan was to get lists of postdocs um, from universities who might have relevant uh, experience and who might not be um, able to get a professor job and um, start research devising this metric and uh, educate the public about general um, safety guidelines. For example, if a random black box comes up to you and tells you things, don't listen to it. Uh, which I think people may not be aware of now because we don't have a legitimate way of um, telling counterfeit algorithms from a real one. And uh, that might also help uh, future voters and consumers um, know what to support and what to do in order to be safe. Awesome, thank you. Uh, who here wants to go first, top or bottom? Okay, I choose bottom. <laughs> sure. All right, uh, we chose pandemic risk. This was partially because that's the area that I work in now. Um, yes, uh, so that's one of the resources we call on, it's me. Um, <laughs> and with the basic idea that we want something, we don't necessarily know what the next pandemic is gonna be, so we need something that's a little bit generalizable. Uh, so we focused on rapid diagnostics, um, surveillance and response. Um, so we were looking at you know ways that you could extremely quickly tell who's infected um, and also be able to quarantine um, said individual so you know set like personal protective equipment and also a information dissemination network so we can tell the whole planet at the drop of a hat that this was happening um, our action plan was to take the next year to pay somebody who was smart um, a nominal salary for the next year to research and find either an academic group or a promising um, company to make, develop a rapid diagnostic. And then? Oh, and then spend the balance of the money and invest that money. So we were going to put all of our eggs in whatever basket we determined was the best one. Yep. <laughs> Sweet, thanks. Would you like to pass it up? So our idea was to focus on neuromorphic AI safety. The, um, the basic idea for those who don't know, there, there are three major I have paths to AI that are most people think are most likely. Uh, de novo AGI, which is what probably you mostly think of, which is computer scientists come up with algorithms for AI from scratch. Whole brain emulation, which is uh, running an emulation of a brain on a computer. And neuromorphic AGI, which is make, uh, getting to AGI by learning more about how the brain works and then basing algorithms loosely on how the brain does. And um, there's been a lot of AI safety work on uh, de novo AI, and uh, whole brain emulation would likely be safe by default, because it's more or less safe by default, because it would act like a normal person. But uh, neuromorphic AGI might be the most dangerous, because it seems potentially really messy and wouldn't have any intrinsic safeguards. And additionally, to the best of our knowledge, no work has been done on neuromorphic AI safety. So we would look at what now seems like the precursor to neuromorphic AI, which is um, computational neuroscience and uh, also cognitive computing. And we would try to, uh, first off, we try to really understand those areas as best we could, uh, leveraging our connections to neuroscience. And then from that, we'd also try to understand uh, AI safety to the extent that we could, especially uh, leveraging our connections within the AI safety community and see what principles within AI safety could be applied to neuromorphic AI, which couldn't, how the ones that could be applied could be applied, and so on.